Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the channel where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology and neurosciences every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and invited lecturer for the past few years. Here I discuss and describe different topics, approaches and research findings regarding psychology and neurosciences the best as I can for you to understand it and for you to learn something about it. All videos here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. Now, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today's theme is focused on psychology. What is psychology? What does it study? How can it be applied in daily life? These are some questions I will try to answer with this video and I hope it will be very useful to you. This video will be divided into two different ones. When I started to edit it, I saw that it has already two minutes long, so I think it was better to divide it into two separate videos. The first video, it will be more focused on the classical approach to psychology. We will look to William James, Wundt, Freud and other perspectives that were a fundamental basis to the development of the scientific psychology. The second part, it will be more focused on the contemporary psychology, such as cognitive approach and cognitive development. So, according to APA, American Psychological Association, psychology is the scientific study of mental processes, the mind and behavior. Despite its complexity, psychology is a very recent science, with most advances happening in the past 150 years. However, its origins may be traced to ancient Greece about 400 and 500 BC. In that time, the emphasis was on the philosophical questions, with thinkers such as Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. Curiously, philosophers used to discuss in that time many topics now studied by modern psychology, such as memory, free will, nature or attraction. Now I will describe the journey that psychology has done through the years from a subfield of uh, philosophy to a scientific field on its own. So, psychology was a subfield of philosophy till the 19th century. However, William Wundt established the first psychological laboratory in Leipzig in uh, 1879. He was a pioneer and attracted a large number of students from different parts of the world who started expanding the discipline. Gradually, the study of psychology was organized around certain schools of thought. The main schools of thought were Structuralism, Functionalism, Behaviorism, Psychoanalytic Theory, Gestalt and Cognitive Approach. However, let's go back a little bit. In the early days of psychology, there were two dominant theoretical perspectives regarding how the world worked, such as Structuralism and Functionalism. Structuralism was the name given to the approach pioneered by William Wundt, which focused on breaking down mental processes into the most basic components. The term originated from Edward Titchener, an American psychology who had been trained by Wundt. Wundt was important because he separated psychology from philosophy by analyzing the workings of the mind in a more structured way, with the emphasis being on objective measurement and control. Structuralism relied on training introspection, a research method whereby subjects report what was going on in their minds while performing a certain task. However, Introspection proved to be an unreliable method because there was too much individual variation on research subjects. Different subjects report different experiences, therefore it was impossible to compare them because of their differences. Despite the failure of introspection, Wundt is an important figure in the story of psychology as he opened the first laboratory dedicated to psychology in 1879 and its opening is usually thought to be the beginning of the experimental psychology. Wundt was a very important person in the development of psychology. However, we can find other researchers that are as well as important as William Wundt. An American psychologist named William James 
developed an approach which came to be known as functionalism. William James argued that the mind is always changing and it's pointless to look for the structure of the conscious experience. Rather, he proposed that the focus should be on how and why an organism does something. For instance, what are the causes of behavior? Or what are the functions of that specific behavior? James suggested that psychology should look to the underlying cause of behavior and mental processes and his emphasis should be on the consequences and the causes of behavior. As you can see, here is the fundamentals of behaviorism. So, structuralism and functionalism have been replaced by several dominant influential approaches to psychology, each one underpinned by a shared set of assumptions of what people are like or what is important to study and how to study it. Freud believed that understanding the unconscious mind was critical to understand conscious behavior. This was especially true for individuals that he saw who suffered from various histories and neuroses. Freud relied on dream analysis, slips of tongue and free association. However, many psychologists were not satisfied by Freud's approach. Therefore, a movement called behaviorism starts to develop. Behaviorism focused on strategies that were uh, based on controlled laboratory experiments and rejection of the unseen of the unconscious forces as causes of behavior. Names as Pavlov, Watson, Skinner were the fathers of behaviorism. It was on this approach that the principles of learning were developed. Behaviorism is largely responsible for establishing psychology as a scientific discipline through its uh, methods of experimentation and empirical findings. Another important uh, psychological approach that was developed was Gestalt approach. Max Wertmeier was the main psychologist of this field. Gestalt psychologists focus on the whole instead of the sum of the parts. Wertheimer stated that the whole is often what the individual responds to its perception. Gestalt psychologist deals with the fact that although a sensory experience can be broken down into individual parts, but how those parts relate to each other as a whole is often what the individual responds to in perception. So, after behaviorism, Carl Rogers uh, coined an approach named humanistic psychology. He stated that the subjective experience and personal growth were key features to understand human development. According to the humanistic perspective, the subjective experiences and interpretations are important to determine the course of their actions. Theories must be useful not only for understanding people, but also for understanding one's own life and uh, one's own self-actualization. However, in the 60s, another uh, revolution starts to emerge. This revolution is called the Cognitive Revolution. Cognitive Revolution started in the 60s and adopted a scientific approach, a lay-based scientific approach to memory, perception, cognitive development, mental illness and much more. The cognitive perspective was focused on uh, mental processes such as memory, attention, decision-making and which mental instances were responsible for cognitive processing. So, as you can see, psychology is a scientific discipline that studies human mind, human processes and uh, overt behavior and was very influential because of different theoretical approaches that were the main fundamentals of the scientific discipline. Psychology uses the scientific method to study memory, cognition, uh, behavior, personality, psychopathology and so forth. So, contemporary psychology has different branches and these branches will be targets of future videos. So please stay tuned if you want to know more about these uh, scientific branches of psychology, such as clinical psychology, psychotherapy, developmental psychology, psychopathology or cognitive neurosciences. Psychology became a scientific field because of the contributions of all of these theoretical approaches. And now let's just summarize the contents of today. Wundt was a structuralist 
which means that he believed that our cognitive experience was best understood by breaking down experience into different parts. William James was the proponent of functionalism. His particular perspective focused on how mental activity served as adaptive responses to an organism environment. Like Wundt, James also relied on introspection. However, his research approach has incorporated more objective measures as well. Freud's psychoanalysis was the original psychodynamic theory, but psychodynamic approaches had different authors such as Jung, Adler and Erickson. Psychoanalytic theory remained a dominant force in clinical psychology for several decades. Gestalt psychology was very influential in Europe. Gestalt psychology takes an holistic view of an individual and his experiences. Uh, Wertmeyer, Koffer and Kohler immigrated uh, to the United States and they start their laboratory studies, uh, which were very important to this kind of approach. Some of the principles of Gestalt psychology are still very influential in the study of sensation and perception. Behaviorism was focused on making psychology an objective science by study over behavior and emphasizing the importance of unobservable mental processes. John Watson is often considered the father of behaviorism and Skinner contributes to the understanding of principles of operant condition cannot be underestimated. The humanistic approach is focused on uh, self-actualization and on human principles. Maslow and Rogers were very influential in shaping humanistic psychology. So, in the 1960s, the cognitive revolution has changed psychology forever by focused on the cognitive processes underlying uh, information processing. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to check the video description to see the references regarding today's theme. Before we go, I would like to know what you think about all of this. So, use the comment section below to express your mind. Also, if you find these contents useful, please leave a like and consider to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information related to psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here, I discuss and talk about different topics related to psychology and neurosciences and try to explain it the best as I can for you to understand it. All videos here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. Without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, this is the second video of the team related to what is psychology. In the first video, we look to uh, classical approaches such as psychoanalysis and structuralism and we saw how them shaped psychology to the scientific discipline that is today. In this video, we will be more focused on the contemporary approach when we look to constructivism and cognitive development as uh, the contemporary basis for the scientific psychology. Nowadays, there are lots of different of, uh, psychological perspectives and psychology continues to evolve uh, every single day. In this video, I will try to summarize some of them. I will describe to you what is biological psychology or what is cognitive psychology or even personality psychology. The other approaches, it will be discussed and described in future videos. Biological psychology considers the human beings as nothing but biological structures. This view prefers analysis of complex phenomena in terms of smaller unities. It has revealed the mysteries of brain function and studies on uh, behavior tend to be analyzed by uh, neuroscience methods. 
This view of psychology is also uh, rooted in evolutionary psychology. However, uh, this connection will also be discussed in future videos. Another very important approach in psychology is the constructivism psychology. Piaget was the main author uh, that stems from this approach and he developed the notion of uh, theories of cognitive development. They think that humans develop meaningful understanding of their experiences and this is the base for the way how they see the world. The constructivist psychology theorizes and studies how human beings create systems to understand their experiences and their worldview. Piaget's approach to constructivism was further developed in the theories of cognitive development. As discussed in the previous video, cognitive psychology uh, was based on a revolution that have changed psychology forever. Cognitive psychology is the area of psychology that focuses on studying cognitions and thoughts and their relationship to our experiences and our actions. In nowadays, this led to some coin the term of cognitive science to describe the interdisciplinary nature of this area of research. Cognitive psychologists have research interests that span a spectrum of topics, ranging from attention to problem solving to language, memory and uh, psychopathology. Also, the approaches used to study these uh, psychological domains are equally diverse, such as experimental settings, fMRI or EAG. As mentioned in a previous video, the cognitive revolution created an impetus for psychologists to focus their attention on better understanding the mind and mental processes that underlying behavior. Like biological psychology, cognitive psychology is a broad in scope and involves different areas and sub-areas that range disciplines, backgrounds that led to developments of every kind of interdisciplinary area. Cognitive psychology, it's not only important in the psychological fields, but it's also important in psychotherapy, because there are lots of schools of psychotherapy that are based on cognitive psychology processes. Principal theory that it's based on the cognitive psychology is cognitive behavior therapy. So, as you may see, psychology has different fields and had uh, different classical theories that steam the way how psychology evolved to a uh, scientific field. What is important to know is that psychology is a scientific discipline that evolved from classical approaches to contemporary approaches. We can think about personality psychology, clinical psychology, organizational psychology, or even educational psychology. Personality psychology focuses on patterns of thoughts and behaviors that make each individual unique. More recently, the study of personality has taken a more quantitative approach. Rather than explaining how personality arises, research is focused on identifying personality traits. Personality traits are relatively consistent patterns of thought and behavior and many have purposed that five trait dimensions are enough to capture various personality domains. These dimensions are known as a big five factor model and include dimensions such as consciousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness to experience and extroversion. So now we may look to the main goals of psychology and mainly we can find four main goals. So the first goal is described. Uh, psychology is aimed in describing behavior or cognition and to develop laws of human behavior. The second goal is to explain. Uh, psychology uh, is focused on explaining how behavior or how cognition influence human development and human relationships. The third main goal is to predict. Psychology aims to be able to predict future behavior from the findings of empirical research. And the last one is to change. Psychology is also focused in describing, explaining and change behaviors that may be maladaptive or uh, may be not adaptive. Now we can answer to the question, 
is psychology a science? Psychology is a science because it has a vast body of classical and contemporary theories and literature who supports the paradigm of psychology. Psychology is a science because it shares principles with other scientific fields such as sociology, neurosciences or even medicine. Psychology is a science because it applies the scientific method to the study of mental processes and behavior. Also, psychology is a science because it applies different methods to study emotion, cognition and behavior. These methods are based in qualitative approach and quantitative approach. And psychology is a science because it relies on statistical analysis to explore the effects between uh, the variables under study. Moreover, we can see how psychology may be applied in daily life. Psychology is the study of human mental process and uh, this mental process may be uh, applied to uh, communication, to relationships, which is a fundamental aspect of human life. Also, psychology may be applied to education, motivation and behavior. Also, psychology may be applied to environmental policy, Psychology is also applied to uh, the development of psychopathology and to uh, the maintenance of mental health. And psychology is also applied uh, in the study of efficacy studies of different therapeutic approaches. And now let's just summarize uh, all the contents that were described here today. Psychology is a diverse discipline and it's made of several major subdivisions. Biological psychology involves the study of biological basis of behavior. Cognitive psychology is concerned with the transformation into the perceptual experiences around the world. Cognitive psychology is concerned with the relationship that exists between thought and behavior. And developmental psychologists study the physical and cognitive changes that occur through the one's lifespan. We can identify four main goals to describe, to explain, to predict and to change. Psychology is a science because it has a strong body of theories and empirical findings and share principles with other related scientific fields. Also, it relies on statistical analysis to support their evidences. And finally, psychology is applied in daily life in areas such as education, environment, mental health, and so forth. It is safe to say that there are lots of things that I did not cover in these two videos. So if you want to know more, please stay tuned to see uh, these future uh, topics described and discussed here in MindBrain Talks. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description to look to the references regarding today's theme. But before we go, I would like to know what you think about all of this. So, use the comment section below to express your mind and say what you think about these themes. Also, if you find these contents useful, leave a like and consider to subscribe, hitting the bell for notifications. Welcome to MindBrain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information related to psychology, psychotherapy, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. In Mind Brain Talks, I describe and discuss different themes related to psychology and neurosciences and try to describe it the best as I can for you to understand and to learn something about it. So, without further delay, 
let's jump for today's content. So today I will talk about the concept of emotion regulation. This concept is a very important concept in psychotherapy and psychology because it's a concept that postulates how humans or how individuals are able to regulate or modulate their emotions. Emotion regulation, it's a human ability and it's very important in everyday life. But let's see how it could be defined. Also, this video it will be framed in the category of theories and concepts. So, let's see what is emotion regulation. Emotion regulation, it's the ability to respond to the ongoing demands of experience with a wide range of emotions. It's the ability to respond to the ongoing demands in a way that is socially acceptable or tolerable. This is a very complex process that involves initiating, inhibiting and modulating one's state or behavior in a given situation. For example, subjective experience of anger in a discussion or subjective um, sadness in a loss. Thus, emotion regulation is a highly significant uh, ability in daily human life. And, generally speaking, there is emotion dysregulation that is defined as the difficulties in controlling or the difficulties in emotional regulation. Emotion dysregulation may be seen as the lack of ability to regulate or to modulate emotions. This lack of disability is highly correlated or highly associated with psychopathological symptoms such as anxiety, depression or interpersonal reactivity. There are lots of psychologists that look to emotional regulation from a different lens. However, Gross is a preeminent author and it's the, uh, one of the greatest theories based on emotional regulation. He has a theory on the process model. The process model of emotion regulation is based upon a model of emotion. The process model of emotion regulation suggests that emotion generation processes occur in a particular sequence over time. The situation that triggers an emotion. Individuals pay attention to uh, the emotion and there is an appraisal based on this attention. Then there is an emotional response that is generated by giving rise to different sensory modalities such as experiential, behavior or physiological systems. Because of an emotional response, it depends on different individuals, this model involves a feedback loop from situation to emotion generation. From this conceptualization, this process model has five different uh, modalities in emotion regulation that respond to particular situations. They occur in the following order. 1. Situation selection. 2. Situation modification. 3. Attentional deployment. 4. Cognitive change. And 5. Response modulation. Also, this model divides the emotion regulation strategies into two broad categories antecedent focused and response focused. Antecedent focused strategies such as situation selection, situation modification, attentional deployment, and cognitive change occur before an emotional response is fully generated. Response focused strategies such as response modulation occur after an emotional response is fully generated. So, as you may see, we may have some emotion regulation strategies that we may use before the emotion is triggered or we may use another kind of uh, emotion regulation strategies that may be activated or we may use when the emotion is fully generated. Emotion regulation strategies may also be divided into other broad categories. One category is situation selection and situation modification. Another category is attentional deployment. In attentional deployment, we may find strategies such as distraction, rumination, worry or thought suppression. Another broad emotion regulation strategy is cognitive change. Here we may find strategies such as reappraisal, distancing and humor. Another broad category may be response modulation. Here we may find strategies such as expressive suppression, drug abuse, exercise or sleep. As you may see, there are lots of strategies that humans use to cope with emotion. However, there are lots of other strategies that were not listed here. In the future, I will look to them and describe the best as I can. Emotion regulation may also be seen as a developmental process. 
emotion regulation efforts during infancy are believed to be guided primarily by innate physiological response systems. These systems usually manifest as an approach or avoidance of pleasant or unpleasant stimuli. Between 3 and 6 months, basic motor functioning and attentional mechanisms begin to play a role in emotion regulation, allowing infants to be more effectively approached or avoid emotional relevant stimuli. Infants may also engage in self-distraction and help-seeking behaviors for regulatory purposes. Later, the emotional regulation strategies employed by the caregivers may also be passed or also be learned by infant. The type of attachment style between caregiver and infant can therefore play a meaningful role in the regulatory strategies that infants may learn to use. By the end of the first year, toddlers begin to adopt new strategies to decrease negative stimuli. Strategies may be such as chewing an object or moving away from something that had upset them. At two years, toddlers can apply certain emotion regulation tactics to influence various emotional states. Emotion regulation knowledge becomes more substantial during childhood. For example, children aged 6 to 10 begin to understand display rules. They come to appreciate the context within certain emotional expressions that are socially accepted or not. For example, children may understand that upon receiving a gift they should display a smile instead of start to cry. During childhood, there is also a trend towards to use more cognitive emotional regulation strategies such as taking the place of distraction, approach and avoidance tactics. Also, regarding the development of emotional dysregulation in children, one finding suggests that children who are frequently exposed to negative emotion at home will be more likely to display and have more difficulties regulating high levels of negative emotion. In adolescence, individuals show a marked increase in their abilities to regulate their emotions. Emotion regulation becomes more complex depending on diverse and multiple factors. Additionally, teenagers have an spontaneous increase of cognitive emotion regulations because of the brain maturation. Finally, in adulthood, as people get older, their motivation to seek emotional meaning in life through social tides tends to increase. Autonomic responses decreases and emotion regulation skills tend to increase. It is important to know that emotion regulation is an ability that is developed through time and many of the strategies that we use to regulate our emotions are learned in social interactions. In this sense, emotion regulation is a process that combines learned behaviors with uh, brain development. Functional magnetic resonance imaging has allowed for the study of emotion regulation on a biological level. Especially, research over the last decade strongly suggests that there is a neural basis for emotion regulation. Research findings report that there is a correlation between emotion regulation and particular patterns of prefrontal activation. These regions include the orbital prefrontal cortex, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Two additional brain structures that have been found to contribute to emotion regulation are the amygdala and the anterior cingulate cortex. An implication of these findings is that individual differences in prefrontal cortex activation may predict the ability to perform different tasks in respect to emotion regulation. Finally, now I will talk a little bit about emotion dysregulation, which is a very pervasive issue in psychopathology. There are lots of people who have psychiatric conditions that also suffer from emotion dysregulation. Individuals who suffer from emotion dysregulation tend to have a rise in psychological and uh, emotional dysfunctions caused by traumatic experiences due to inability to regulate emotions. These traumatic experiences typically may happen in the grade school and are sometimes associated with bullying or victimization. Toxic early experiences tend to be correlated with uh, emotion dysregulation or emotion regulational difficulties. Therefore, individuals who suffer from uh, dysfunctional aspects during uh, childhood and adolescence may be um, more vulnerable to, this, to have uh, psychological symptoms or psychiatric conditions. 
Emotion regulation is all very important in psychotherapy because lots of schools of psychotherapy have different strategies to deal with emotion dysregulation. Approaches such as cognitive behavior therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, mindfulness based therapy, or even emotion focused therapy have different ways uh, to regulate emotions. So now let's just summarize the contents of today. Emotion regulation is an ability to modulate or to regulate emotions. One prominent author, that is Gross, had developed a process model. This model has five stages such as situation selection, situation modification, attentional deployment, cognitive change and response modulation. We also saw that there is different categories uh, and different kinds of emotion regulation strategies such as situation selection, attentional deployment, distraction and is also a developmental process. Emotion regulation has a neurological basis which uh, represents the maturation of the frontal cortex. We saw that Emotion regulation is very important in psychotherapy and emotion dysregulation tends to be associated or correlated with uh, psychiatric or uh, psychological conditions. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to check the video description to see the references list regarding the today's team. Before we go, I would like to know what you think about all of this. Use the comment section below to express your thoughts and to express your mind. Also, if you find this content useful, leave a like and please consider to subscribe, hitting the bell for notifications. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here, in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe lots of topics, research findings and concepts from neurosciences to psychology and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand and for you to know something more about it. All research here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So without further delay, let's jump for today's content. Today's theme is related to metacognition. What is metacognition? How can it be applied to different schools of psychology? And how can it be applied in a clinical settings? This is some uh, answers that I'll give to you in this video. This video, it will be framed in the category of concepts and theories. So now let's see what is metacognition. Metacognition is a human ability to be aware, to reflect, to control one's thoughts and internal mental process. Usually we can call this about cognition about cognition, thinking about thinking, knowing about knowing, aware of awareness. Typically is viewed as a higher order thinking skills that allows strategic thinking. Also, it can be defined as knowledge about when and how to use particular strategies for learning or problem solving and typically it may be described uh, by these two components knowledge about cognition and the regulation of cognition. John Flavel say that uh, metacognition is a higher level order cognition which is labeled by this uh, prefix of meta to describe how we use cognition to think and to reflect about our own cognition. 
In the Neo-Piagetian theories of cognitive development, Demetrius' theory was based on a concept called hypercognition that was related to self-monitoring, self-representation and self-regulation. We can look to metacognition by these three phases planning, monitoring and evaluation and the product of these three phases can be viewed as reflection. So, these three phases can be applied to how individuals look to their own cognition and how they reflect about the contents of that cognition and reflect about the processes that they use to produce some kind of thoughts, feelings, behaviors from self and other. We can also look to metacognition within these compounds. Mental abilities that involves active control over the process of thinking that is used in learning situations, metacognitive knowledge, metacognitive regulation and metacognitive experiences. There are three types of metacognitive awareness when considering metacognitive knowledge. Declarative knowledge, which is knowledge about oneself, about ourselves. Procedural knowledge, which is knowledge about how to do things, how we use our mental heuristics to behave in a given situation or to apply a given strategy to enhance cognitive learning or school contents and so forth. And the third, conditional knowledge, knowing when and why to use declarative and procedural knowledge, again, to apply in the specific situation. Metacognitive regulation or regulation of cognition may also contain these three skills. Planning, selection of strategies to correct allocation of resources then affect test performance. Monitoring, one's awareness of comprehension and test performance. Okay, it's the monitoring, it's the ongoing awareness about the products that we are performing within a different or within a given task. And of course, evaluation or evaluating, apprising the final product to a task and if you can see that is a result from the performance given in certain task. Also, metacognition may be viewed as a developmental process. It is important to know that metacognition is a human ability that is developed from, from childhood to adulthood. Also, some authors say that metacognition may follow the um, cognitive development proposed by Piaget. So, let's now see how it unfolds here. Typically, metacognition is developed through early ages. However, we tend to use the concept of metacognition when the children have to 5 to 7 years old. However, by the age of 3, children have acquired some awareness of themselves and the others. Also, in the age of 4, they understand others' behavior and understand that their behavior is guided by some inner convictions or, as you can see here, by some beliefs and desires that may not be the same as the children. Thus, metacognition may follow the four steps of cognitive development proposed by Piaget which is sensorial motor stage, pre-operational stage, concrete operational stage and formal operational stage. Don't be worried, in the future videos I will describe these uh, cognitive stages one by one for you to know more about how to apply this to human development. Thus, as some constructs or concepts in psychology, there are many overlapping concepts that may be related to metacognition or may be similar to metacognition. So, let's look to them right now. One is called theory of mind, one is called social cognition, one is called alexithymia, which may be viewed as a deficit or a difficulty on the awareness about inner and external emotional states. Affect consciousness, which may be related to alexithymia. Mentalization, which is a process that is very similar to metacognition. And also, we can look to metacognition from a neuroscience perspective. Therefore, we can see that metacognition has some 
identified neuronal basis. So, let's look here. Metacognition involves the regulation of attention, conflict resolution, error correction, and inhibitory and emotional regulation. Thus, we know by neuroscience methods that these processes are mediated by the middle frontal brain sections, the middle frontal brain regions, such as anterior cingulate cortex and orbitofrontal cortex. Also, there are some overlap of metacognition with other executive functions because of the overlapping neuronal structures or brain structures that are underlying these kind of processes, such as metacognition may be related to working memory or also it may be related to executive control or even cognitive inhibition or behavioral inhibition. This is why a frontal lobe has a very important role on the regulation of higher order mental abilities. Frontal lobe is a more development part of the brain which is proposed to be underlying this kind of higher order neurocognitive processes. So, we can look to metacognition and we can relate metacognition with other areas such as metacognition and education. We can look again to these three phases, planning, monitoring and evaluation, and we can look how these phases may impact the learning process. So, Perkins defined that children may have different learning styles. The first one is tacit learners, the second is aware learners, the third is strategic learners, the fourth is reflective learners. So, I think these four styles are very self-explanatory. Again, metacognition may be related to social cognition. Why? Because metacognition also implies the cognitive processing of the mental states, desires, wishes and behaviors of the others. That's why cognitive psychology and social cognition are very interested in the metacognitive processes. So, combination of social psychology and metacognition is referred to as social cognition where is described thinking and describing the other's behaviors, other's emotional states, other's attitudes or self-attitudes. Uh, another concept that is uh, used in social cognition is life scripts, which is the number of things that we do that is described in our mind with a script, a framework. Just like I go to one restaurant, I will ask to that person what is the menu for today and then I sit in the table and then I start to eat. This is an example of a social script. So, also, metacognition and social cognition are implied and are driven to study social perceptions. And also, and finally, social cognition is also focused in cultural beliefs. As a researcher, I am very interested in the topic of metacognition because it can be applied to a psychotherapeutic setting and I will show to you how it can be conceptualized to be used as a clinical tool or as a clinical target to develop consciousness awareness about our own mental processes. Also, I publish an article that I'll show here to you and this article is related to a metacognitive self-assessment scale. Don't worry, in the future I will describe this article to you and I'll show you how it can be applied not only also in uh, clinical settings but also in educational settings. Now, this is a part that is very interesting to me because now I will say to you two different clinical models that can be used in clinical settings and these clinical models are based on a metacognitive model. So, they are a little bit different but they can be very useful to you to understand how you can apply some clinical strategies to enhance metacognitive skills. So, let's see the first one. The first one it's the metacognitive multifunction model that was developed by Semerari and uh, colleagues and regards metacognition as a set of intended functions. The first is to identify and describe mental states regarding self and others based on internal experience and observable behavior. 
in the second level is to reflect and to reasoning about these diverse mental contents such as states of mind. Third, to use the mental information for complex decision making and problem solving also and to use this kind of information to cope with inner suffering. Lots of research has studied the application of this model to neuropsychiatric disorders or psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia, personality disorders and depression. The other model is the self-regulatory executive function that is developed by Wells. So, self-regulatory executive function is a system that encompasses metacognitive beliefs and the mental modes of the executive function. Typically, uh, this function within this, all these contents may be called the cognitive attentional syndrome that uh, implies individuals to develop some kind of worry and rumination. Individuals are also focused in threat monitoring and they have different coping behaviors that tend to backfire. So the coping behaviors are not adaptive because they backfire and increase and increase the emotional suffering underlying this cognitive attentional syndrome. Typically, is related to social anxiety, generalized anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depression. So, there are three main psychotherapy schools that are focused in metacognition. One is metacognitive therapy, the other one is metacognitive interpersonal therapy from Dimaggio et al. And the other one is focused on a similar concept, which is mentalization, which is a kind of therapy that is developed from Fonagi and his colleagues, which is called the mentalization-based therapy. Don't worry, these kinds of therapies will be target of future videos. So now, let's just summarize our contents for today. So, metacognition may be viewed as a higher order ability, typically known as thinking about thinking or cognition about cognition. Metacognitive or metacognition has different compounds and components and it tends to be developed through different cognitive stages. We also saw that the frontal lobe tends to be proposed as a neuronal basis for metacognitive thinking, metacognitive abilities and it may be overlapped with executive functions. Metacognition may be related to social cognition and education and can be applied within different clinical models. We also saw that metacognition is related to different psychological disorders and there are different psychotherapies that are focused on promoting some kind of skills based on metacognitive procedures, metacognitive knowledge and are defined with different metacognitive models. So, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme, to see the books and the manuals that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing here, please consider to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications and leave a comment to express your mind and to express your thoughts. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology and neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand and for you to learn something more about it. All research here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. 
So today I'll talk about cognitive dissonance. Probably you already have heard something about this. On the internet there are lots of different definitions about cognitive dissonance, however some of them are pretty inaccurate. So here I will give to you a scientific and accurate take on cognitive dissonance based on the former author, ok? But first let's see the manuals that I recommend to you. So let's go! So now let's look to the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is a theory of cognitive dissonance from Leon Festinger, which is the first author to propose this theory. The second book is The Cognitive Dissonance 50 Years of a Classic Theory from Joel Cooper. And the third is Cognitive Dissonance Re Examine a Pivotal Theory in Psychology. So, and now let's see what is cognitive dissonance. Individuals are driven by internal drives, urges and or needs that motives internal and external actions. When individuals face different or opposite chunks of information in memory, tends to have a sense of extrangeness and affective discomfort. In this sense, some internal and external maneuvers may take place to deal with this strangeness. This means that individuals tend to experience some discomfort when they are dealing with opposite views or opposite beliefs. So, cognitive dissonance is used to describe the feelings of discomfort that result from two contradictory beliefs. When there is a discrepancy between beliefs and behaviors, something must change in order to eliminate or reduce the dissonance because the discomfort tends to increase. Liam Festinger published in 1957 a book called A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance. He stated that people experience discomfort when they hold conflict beliefs or when their actions contradict their previous beliefs. Some examples that Festinger gave in his book, for instance, smoking even knowing that is bad for health, or individuals may promote some behavior but not apply it to oneself. This is also called hypocrisy. Another example may be a person that defends animal rights but continues to eat meat in their meals. This is also called the meat paradox. We can talk about this in the future. So, why people have cognitive dissonance? Because humans have a principle of cognitive consistency or self-coherence, which is the principle or the psychological need, we can talk about this in the future, or the psychological need of coherence between thoughts, emotions, behavior and emotional past learnings. If we have this principle and we have a contradictory beliefs, we tend to experience discomfort that stems from these contradictory positions or two oppositional beliefs. So, as you are seeing, humans tend to experience different levels of discomfort due to discrepancies between beliefs, thoughts, emotions and behaviors. And humans are driven by the coherence principle or the psychological need that is defined as self-coherence. Because of this principle, humans tend to reduce the level of discomfort that stems from oppositional views of different points of the self. And now let's see other factors that tend to be associated with cognitive dissonance. Also, we can find some personality and neurocognitive factors that has impacts on cognitive dissonance. Metacognitive awareness for contradictory information held in memory. Focused attention. Individuals may focus attention on these two chunks of information or these two beliefs. Lower tolerance for uncertainty. Lower frustration tolerance. Or even lower self coherence as opposed to self coherence. We have a dialectical pole of psychological need, which is a self coherence and self coherence. And if individuals are able to experience these two oppositional beliefs without discomfort, this is linked to um, psychological health and mental health. I will talk about this phenomenon in the future because we can have seven polarities of psychological needs that are fundamentals or are essential for psychological health. I am a researcher on this area and then I will talk about these specifically in the future, ok? So now let's move on. We can also find other factors that may be associated with cognitive dissonance, such as type of beliefs, when we think about a surface level. 
The value of those beliefs may also be important to understand why individuals experience some degree of discomfort. And other factor that is associated with cognitive dissonance is the size of the disparity between beliefs. If we have two major beliefs that are in opposition, individuals tend to experience even more discomfort, okay? And finally, when we look to a deeper level, we may have some contradictory self-facets, which is responsible for a deeper dissonance or inner comfort. When we are looking to this at a deeper level, okay? Don't worry, in the future I will talk about these uh, different levels of human mind that tend to have different levels of dissonance. When we talk about dissonance on beliefs, we are talking about a surface level. But however, when we are talking about contradictory or oppositional personality traits or self-facets, we are talking about a deeper level of cognitive dissonance or affective dissonance that tends to promote internal conflicts, okay? This is a deeper level of analysis and typically this is a level of analysis that psychotherapists tend to focus, okay? Moreover, we can find some different effects of cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance causes feelings of discomfort and unease and humans have an innate desire to avoid discomfort because this discomfort impacts on behaviors and actions, thoughts and decisions, emotions and feelings, beliefs and attitudes. And, as I said before, cognitive dissonance is associated with mental health, especially uh, when individuals feel anxious, guilt, ashamed, confused or reject due to their levels of cognitive dissonance. So, as you are seeing, cognitive dissonance impacts on different spheres of human experience. And now let's see the coping mechanisms and the mental defenses that individuals tend to use to reduce the discomfort that stems from cognitive dissonance. So, individuals may hide their genuine beliefs and beliefs from others. Individuals may use rationalization of their choices to match previous assumptions. Also, individuals may avoid subjects or teams that activate discussions of their contradictory opinions. And individuals may also try to avoid learning new information because this may increase their levels of discomfort. Also, individuals may devaluate, attack or deny others' actions and beliefs that are contradictory to their own. Individuals may also discard research, newspaper articles or expert explanations. And individuals may distort information to fit their previous beliefs or schemas. In the future, I'll talk about schemas because I am a researcher on this specific area, okay? So I have lots of insight knowledge that I want to share with you. So, some authors gave some suggestions about how to reduce cognitive dissonance. One is harmonization of contradictory beliefs by focus on the healthier belief. Another suggestion is adopt beliefs and attitudes who are internally coherent. Another suggestion is evaluate both beliefs who are in contradiction and learn to tolerate this conflict. And the final suggestion is change the belief to match the previous belief system. So, as you are seeing here, there is an increasing level of difficulty in applying these suggestions to oneself. Changing beliefs, typically, it's not an easy task, okay? However, this is the suggestions that some authors gave. And now let's just summarize the contents of today. So, we saw that cognitive dissonance is a mental phenomenon that humans tend to have when they find contradictory or oppositional beliefs. Typically, it's associated with personality and neurocognitive factors. Individuals tend to develop some coping mechanisms and mental defenses to try to deal with the discomfort that stems from this dissonance. And there are different ways to reduce cognitive dissonance, and some are easy and some are more difficult. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme in order to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing here, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your thoughts and to express your mind. Welcome to MindBrain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!
Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand and for you to learn something more about it. All research here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today we will talk about the information processing paradigm. We will look to the major models that shape this paradigm and we will look how this paradigm has some impacts in cognitive psychology. But first, let's look to the manual that I recommend to you. The first is Cognitive Psychology, a student's handbook. The second is Cognitive Psychology and its implications. And the third is an introduction to cognitive science. And now, let's see what is the information processing paradigm. So, the first half of the 20th century was ruled by behaviorism, and the mind was viewed as a black box. However, around the 1950s, computers gave new ideas to psychologists to conceptualize mental processes. So, this was an approach that helped psychologists to conceptualize the mental processes beyond the black box metaphor. So, we are looking to a new metaphor, which is a metaphor that describes the mind as a set of processes such as attention, perception or memory. The mind was compared to how computers process information. So, some main examples may be attention and perception, may be related to inputting information into a computer. Or memory, may be similar to the computer storage. So, cognitive psychology was very, very influenced by this theory, and cognitive psychology starts to get focused on how individuals process information in different cognitive processes such as memory, attention, decision making or perception. So cognitive psychology was focused on the flow of information through different stages of the cognitive processing. And cognitive psychology starts to get focused on how individuals select, store and ret retrieve memories. So, this shows how cognitive psychology was influenced by uh, the information processing paradigm. So, now let's look to some influential models that shaped cognitive psychology. George Miller in Information Processing Theory, which states that human mind performs operations that change information, form and content, stores and locates that information and gives some output based on that transformed information. This means that the human mind has some uh, operations that changes the information and then produces some output that is based on the transformed information. So humans gather and represent information, we are talking about the encoding process, and hold information in memory, which may be called retention process, and get access to that information, which can be defined as the retrieval process of that information. So, Atkinson and Schifrins also developed the stage theory, which uh, described how information is stored in memory through a linear process. So, they stated that these processes has three stages. Information first gets to the sensory memory, then passes to the short-term memory or the working memory, and then is uh, encoded and retrieved and is retained in the long-term memory, which may be differentiated in decorative or procedural. But we will talk this in the future, okay? This is just a brief look on the information processing paradigm. So another model is the Craig and Lockhart level of processing model which is also a very important model in this paradigm. They stated that the elaboration of information in memory may take different levels from the surface level to a deeper level. The first level we can find perception, below we can see intention, and then we can look to labeling information, and then we look to the meaning attribution, okay? When we start to attribute meaning to the information or meaning to the events, it means that we are getting to a deeper level of the information processing. Another influential model was a model proposed by Rumblehart and McClellans, 
they stated that information is processed by multiple parts of the cognitive system at the same time. So this model stated that information may be processed in multiple parts of the brain, in the multiple parts of the cognitive system in a parallel fashion. So, the information is stored in different parts of the brain, which are connected through a wide network of neurons. Some notions may also be important to retain, however, I will not focus uh, specifically on these notions, ok? In cognitive psychology, we tend to look to linear and parallel processing, because information may follow a sequence of events, however, uh, information may also be processed in a parallel fashion based on connectionist models. Information processing may also follow a bottom-up or top-down processing, which means that information may be triggered by the environment or the information may start the processing by inner stimuli, ok? But we will talk this in the future, don't worry. And another established notion of the processing of information is that if processing of information and cognitive development are tied. So individuals in earlier ages may have some type of cognitive processing and individuals in the later ages have different types of cognitive processing. But don't worry, we can talk about this in the future and we will look to the Piaget model which states exactly these things, ok? But we will look to this in the future. So now let's just summarize the contents of today. So in the middle of the 20th century mind was viewed as a black box. Uh, the information processing theory and cognitive psychology are mixed together, so cognitive psychology absorbed the information processing paradigm and this paradigm shaped how cognitive psychology starts to look to the mental processes. So cognitive psychology may resemble of different models that may be defined as linear models and cognitive psychology may also rely on connectionist models. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme in order to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing here, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. You can use the comment section below to express your thoughts and to express your mind about all the concepts and all the tiers that are discussed here. Let me know what you think about all of this. Welcome to Mindbrain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who's been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in Mind Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to learn something more about it. All contents here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today let's talk about psychological flexibility and mental health. We will take a brief look on this concept and we will see how this concept will be related to the other psychological concepts such as executive functions or personality. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is the Assessment and Commitment Therapy from Steve Hayes. The second is Psychological Flexibility, also from Steve Eyes. And the third is Contextual Behavioral Science, where you can find different chapters related to psychological flexibility. So now let's see what is psychological flexibility. 
Psychological flexibility may be viewed as a fundamental aspect in mental health, because it can be viewed as a skill which allows individuals to distance themselves from internal distressful experience, and another process that is related to this is the centering, cognitive distancing or diffusing. And psychological flexibility is associated with emotion regulation strategies. So, psychological flexibility refers to several dynamic processes that unfold over time. It allows individuals to adapt to fluctuating situational demands and allows individuals to reconfigure mental resources, allows them to shift perspective from one uh, point of view to other point of view, and uh, it enables individuals to balance competing desires, needs and life domains related to specific contextual demands. So, this skill allows individuals to balance competing desires and needs and select these desires and these needs according to specific situational demands. However, psychological flexibility also suffers from a problem that other psychological constructs may suffer, which is there are different names that tries to identify the same construct. And one outcome of this problem is that research may be fragmented because ego resiliency may also overlap with psychological flexibility, executive control, response modulation, or even self-regulation. These four constructs may also have some overlapping domain with psychological flexibility. And psychological inflexibility, which is the opposite of the flexibility, may be uh, related to anxiety, depression, poor work performance, inability or difficulties in learning, substance abuse, lower quality in life, alexithymia, more anxiety uh, sensitivity, long-term disability or even worry. So, there is a type of psychotherapy that has a specific model focused on psychological flexibility and this therapy is called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a third generation CBT. So, this model stresses that psychological flexibility depends on six process that are connected with each other. So the first is diffusion, the second acceptance, the third contact with the present moment, the fourth values, the fifth committed action and the sixth self as context. Don't worry, in the future I will produce different videos focused specifically on the acceptance and commitment therapy. Here it's just important to see that this model developed by Hayes and colleagues focused specifically on promoting psychological flexibility, which may be viewed as an outcome of these interconnected six processes. Also, you can see that the connectiveness of these processes enables mindfulness and acceptance processes, which allows individuals to distance themselves from distressful thoughts and emotions and allows them to accept that internal experience and allows to take contact with the present moment that enables the emotional processing. Also, when we look to contact with the present moment, we can see that there is a shift focused on commitment and behavior change processes, which allows individuals to connect to their present moment and allows them to enable and discover different lifelong values, which allows them to commit to that action. And this committed action allows them to be more flexible to adapt to life demands. Also, you can see that when we are able to apply this this notion of flexibility to ourselves, we can look to ourselves as a product or as an, an emergent self within a specific context. In the future, I'll take a deep look on the acceptance and commit therapy principles. So, this is just for the basis. A psychological flexibility is the target, it's a specific target of this third generation CBT therapy, which is the acceptance and commitment therapy. However, uh, I've produced some new articles this year focused specifically on how psychological inflexibility may impact or may relate to different constructs. I've used cognitive fusion as a measure of uh, psychological inflexibility, which means that individuals are fused with their internal experience and they cannot distance themselves from um, distressful thoughts, emotions and behaviors. So this may be viewed as a form of inflexibility because individuals are always experiencing the same things because they can't distance themselves, they can't diffuse themselves from their thoughts, their emotions and their behaviors. So, what I found is that cognitive fusion mediates the relationships between early maladaptive schemas and symptomatology. 
Also, I found that metacognitive abilities or metacognitive skills are negative associated with cognitive fusion because if individuals are fused with their contents, they cannot distance themselves within the four or five metacognitive factors that research shows that is present in the human mind. So another research showed that there is a transdiagnostic value of the relationship between inflexibility and emotion regulation. However, there are different levels of association. In the future, I'll take a deep look on this, okay? So this is just for you to understand how uh, psychological inflexibility may relate to other different concerns. However, let's look now how psychological inflexibility may relate to other different concerns. So we can look to uh, personality such as neuroticism, openness to experience and self-control. Individuals who are more flexible tend to have lower levels of neuroticism and higher levels of openness to experience and self-control. Also, individuals who are psychological flexible may have better working memory, they are more able to change within different cognitive categories and also they can change more easily their attentional control to different stimuli. Finally, psychological flexibility may also be related to the states of mind because when we are locked in all the same mindsets, on all the same states of mind, we cannot produce novelty and open to ourselves to new experiences and to new thoughts, new feelings, new goals and new needs. So, a psychological flexibility depends also from states of mind because different states of mind may have different impacts on how individuals open themselves to experience and are more able to produce new thoughts, new feelings and new behaviors. So now let's just summarize the contents of today. So we look to psychological flexibility, which may be viewed as a core aspect in mental health. So psychological flexibility may also be related to different uh, psychological disorders. We saw that acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a third generation CBT, has a specific model to work on psychological flexibility. And finally, we saw that there are new research in psychological inflexibility at the moment and we look basically to three articles focused on different aspects of psychological inflexibility. However, there are lots of manuscripts that also have uh, new evidences about uh, psychological flexibility and their relationship with other constructs. Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme to look to the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing here, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notification. You may use the comment section below to express your thoughts and to express your mind. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! Brain Talks, the place where you find diverse and scientifically accurate information regarding psychology, neuropsychology, neurosciences and research methods every single week. My name is Bruno Faustino, I am a licensed clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has been working as a therapist, researcher and educator for the past few years. Here in my Brain Talks, I discuss and describe different topics from psychology to neurosciences and I try to explain them the best as I can for you to understand and for you to learn something more about it. All research here are just for educational purposes and it's not intended to diagnose any psychiatric condition or neurological disorder. So, without further delay, let's jump for today's content. So, today I'll talk about emotional experience. I'll take a brief look of the major topics of emotions and we will see how emotional experience may impact in different areas of human functioning. But first, let's see the manuals that I recommend to you today. The first is The Emotional Brain from Joseph Lido. The second is True to Our Feelings. 
and the third is the Handbook of Emotional Regulation, edited by James Gross. And now let's look to emotions. Emotions are short-term biological states associated with neurophysiological changes which provoke us thoughts, feelings and behavioral responses or action tendencies. Emotions tend to be discrete, measurable and physiologically distinct from one another. Emotion experience is different from emotions. So, emotional experiences is the subjective experience of emotions or emotional states. Emotions are the short-term biological states and emotional experience is the subjective experience that individuals have when they are experiencing emotions. And emotional experiences may be described as pleasant or unpleasant and may be described as intense or mild. Emotional states are accompanied by arousal and our experiences of the bodily responses created by the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. So, emotional states are accompanied by different bodily sensations which represent a sympathetic activation of the automatic nervous system. Emotions are developed in large part to help us to make rapid judgments about stimuli and to quickly guide appropriate behavior. That's why emotions set some behavioral tendencies. Emotions have a great neurobiological emphasis because they are produced in the limbic system, which encompass amygdala, hypothalamus, thalamus, and is not close to this, and emotions are also generated by some divisions of the prefrontal cortex, such as the anterior reticulate or the orbitofrontal cortex. Moreover, we can find different emotions. We can distinguish from basic emotions to complex or secondary emotions. So, basic emotions we can see as anger, disgust, fear, happiness, sadness and surprise. And these emotions tend to be generated at the subcortical level. And these emotions are evolutionary determined and typically they are experiences and displayed similarity across cultures because these basic emotions have a great neurobiological emphasis and great genetic determinism. That's why from different cultures individuals tend to express them psychological, emotionally and behaviorally in the same way. However, you can also differentiate other emotions, which are defined as secondary emotions, or uh, some researchers may refer it as feelings. I have here some examples, such as frustration, distress, bored, calm, satisfied, and so on. There are different secondary emotions, which have different intenses and different forms of experiences. Typically, these emotions are generated at the cortical level because they have a great input given by the prefrontal cortex. So, secondary emotions tend to be associated with cognitive interpretations that accompany emotions. Typically, you can call this process as cognitive appraisal. So, typically, secondary emotions are determined in part by their level of arousal, which can range from mild to intense, and their valence, which may be pleasant or unpleasant. As you are seeing, emotional experience is a major aspect of the human life and has different implications on human functioning. So, we can find two major pathways for emotion generation. Primary and secondary emotions activation may depend on the pathway by which the stimuli takes to reach the cortex. So, we can look by uh, analyzing the fear processing in different brain regions. We can have a stimulus. This stimulus projects itself to the thalamus. The thalamus sends information to amygdala, which also then projects a response. We can call this the fast pathway. So, but when we look to the danger sensation or the sense of afraid in a given context, we are looking to a different set of activation. We can have a stimulus that reaches to the thalamus and the thalamus projects outputs to the frontal cortex and then the frontal cortex projects the information to amygdala. And then amygdala produces a response by projecting the information to the primary motor cortex. So we are seeing here that in the danger sensation, we have a frontal cortex input and this input gives some context and some previous knowledge 
about the stimulus. So in this sense, we have a mixed response where we have a stimulus and we have um, cognitive interpretation or a cognitive memory. So we call this a slow pathway. And the secondary emotion is generated because it has more cognitive component than the primary fear. So this is an important distinction between primary emotions and secondary emotions or feelings. They may depend on the different activations which are the product of different pathway activations. So one major aspect that could make some difference between secondary emotions and primary emotions is the cognitive reappraisal, which is a process that is tendency allocated in the prefrontal cortex. Because the process of the cognitive appraisal may be seen as the interpretation of the situations and experiences based on the previous knowledge. So, this interpretation is based on previous assumptions and beliefs and in intentions, goals or even in psychological needs. So, cognitive appraisal adds a cognitive component to the primary emotion. This is where we start to feel a more complex, a more differentiated emotion, which is called here a secondary emotion or even a feeling. So, there are different models of emotion that could also help us explain how emotion is generated. Cannon bar theory states that experience of an emotion is accompanied by physiological arousal. James Lane theory states that the experience of an emotion is the result of the arousal that individuals experience. So, the two-factor theory states that the intensity of the arousal and the cognitive appraisal dictates which emotion individuals will experience. So, here you can see that the two-factor theory has an integrative component, where we can explain that the arousal and the association of the cognitive appraisal dictates which emotion will be generated and which emotion individuals will experience. So emotions have different functions. One may be facilitate adaptive responses to environmental challenges. A second may be attach meaning to the events. The third may be communication to self about values, needs, or even if the contest is favorable to them. Or even communication to others, because when we manifest an emotion, we are communicating to others an internal state or a disposition. And this behavioral manifestation may be seen as non-verbal behaviors. So, now let's just summarize the contents of today. Emotions and subjective experience are different phenomena, but they are linked together. This phenomenon results from the interaction between the brain, nervous system and endocrine system. We can differentiate primary and secondary emotions by the level of the arousal and the uh, addition of a cognitive component. And we look to different models of emotions. So, this is just an introductory video related to emotions. But in the future, I will produce different videos focused specifically on different aspects or different models of emotions, ok? So, stay tuned! Well, it's all for today. Don't forget to see the video description regarding today's theme in order to see the manuals and the books that I recommend to you. Also, if you like what I'm doing here, please consider to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And you can use the comment section below to express your thoughts and to express your mind. Let me know what you think about all of this. Welcome to Mind Brain Talks and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!